Okay. Um, well, good evening to all of you. I'm glad everybody's here. Um, I didn't. Uh, well, first, let me just say if anyone would like to testify or have a comment or something. Clark, if you're talking, your microphone is muted. I see you talking, but you may not there be talking is. to us. I got it now. Okay. Glad to be here. Talking right. to Brother Smith last night and got all the information I needed, and here I am. So, all right. I'm John Clark. I'm in San Diego. Brother Clark. Brother Clark is the one that made the app to all of the, uh, it's the directory to all the assemblies in the body of Christ. If you don't have that app on your phone, it's something you'd really appreciate having. It tells what all time service to start and, and locations. You can even click on the map and, and that's how I go. When I go to another assembly, I just click on that app location and go and then my, my maps tell me where to go. Anyway, he's a guy, he's a genius to put all that together. Oh, I don't know about genius. I'm learning this <laughs> as I go along. Well, <laughs> anyway, it's, it's a great tool for all of us, that's for sure. What's the app called? Uh, it's just church directory. Uh, let me uh, just do it this way. Is that under the Apple iPhone app? Yeah, you can put it in either in iPhone. He'll, he can put it in our chat. Okay. The link that you need to go to and you, you can, you know, you can go to it and then you can, you can make it a, a part of your home screen. You can, you can make it part of your home screen and, and it shows every assembly in the body of Christ in every state and every pastor and, all of that and their time, service times, like our shows this Thursday night uh, Zoom meeting. Technically, it's not an app; it's a website. If it was an app, all you iPhone users would be out of luck because I use Android. Yeah. So, with it yeah. being a website, you can everybody can use it, and no matter yeah. what device, uh, laptop, desktop, telephone, tablet, whatever, you can use it. So. I tried to make it as easy as possible. And uh, I have a small prayer request. Actually, it's a huge prayer request. Uh, my youngest sister apparently has pancreatic cancer. And she's not doing really, really, really good. So I'd appreciate a whole lot of prayer. All right. Yes, we'll do that. We always have a prayer at the end of our service uh, for our, our prayer request. So we'll include her tonight. Um, okay, I, uh, yes, yes. I'd like to welcome uh, Pastor Rod Clark. He's, he's joined with us here today. I just wanted to welcome him. Yes, he got on before you did, and we, we talked just a little bit. And we're glad that he's he's uh, with us tonight. So uh, he's, he's a friend and connection with Brother Terry, and and uh, so I don't know how, but some at some point he he um, heard either us on Zoom or on YouTube or somewhere, and anyway. Uh, wanted to connect with us, so we're glad that he's here. Um, I really, um, you know, Monday night on Monday nights, I have uh, 
a, a Zoom meeting with the Dominican Republic, and uh, which is a a, a a bilingual service. And uh, anyway, I, I had some questions, and somehow I don't even remember how, but I I got to talking on. Uh, on first heaven and and uh, mentioned the word first heaven and that got me into talking about first second and third heaven which is so common you know with us most of us anyway and um but the more i talked on it the more i thought you know it probably wouldn't hurt to go over this and so I thought I might say something about it tonight. Um, you know, there is not a scripture in the Bible with the term second heaven in it. But there is a scripture. There's two scriptures, one with the term third heaven and one with the term first heaven. And I'll give you those scriptures here in a minute. The uh, the tabernacle is probably the best picture we have. Tabernacle and the temple is probably the best picture that we have as far as um, having a picture or a type of these heavens are, uh, I think you could call at least the first and second heaven as conditions more than actual locations or places. Third heaven, uh, I think, is definitely a place. Uh, but it, it these it's a process of salvation that's shown in the tabernacle. The outer court in the tabernacle is a picture of first heaven. Uh, the holy place is a picture of second heaven. And the Holy of Holies is a picture of third heaven. Again, there are, you know, Noah's Ark had three compartments to it or three floors. Uh, Noah and his family was up, up on the third floor where there was a window where he let the raven and the dove out. They're just pictures in the Bible, but they're, they're meaningful and needful pictures for us to understand and the salvation of the Lord. Here, let me give you this scripture in uh, 2 Corinthians. Um, in fact, I'll share my screen with you so you can see my Bible. Uh, that's helpful. Uh, so here in 2 Corinthians, uh, 12 verse 2 Paul said I knew a man above 14 years ago whether in the body I cannot tell or out of the body I cannot tell God knoweth such a one caught up unto the third heaven and I knew such a man whether in the body or, of, or out of the body I cannot tell God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. Uh, if you'll notice here, he was caught up unto, up to the third heaven, not in it, but uh, just up to it. Like, I mean, this is obviously was a, uh, a spiritual experience that the apostle Paul had, and he was caught up to third heaven, but then in verse four, he said how that he was caught up into paradise. Paradise, uh, we'll show here in a few minutes, that paradise is a picture of second heaven. Uh, same as the Garden of Eden. It's the same as the holy place, basically. But um, I'm just showing you the scripture that uses the terminology or the phrase third heaven. He was caught up to third heaven, but he was caught up into paradise where he heard these unspeakable words. Then in Revelations 21, 
Um, here, John is shown, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now, <clears throat> here, of course, is the terminology first heaven. Um, and of course, we've, you know, I've always said, if there's a first and a third, there's got to be a second. If you can count to three, you know that. So, so um, uh, in first heaven here, John sees it in the book of Revelation. And this is, you know, there's only 22 chapters. So this is the end of the, literally to, at the end of the book where there is, uh, there's first heaven and first earth that passed away. So you wouldn't want to be in first heaven at this time. Uh, and, and so if you go back, and there's also first earth passed away. In other words, the corruption, the earth that was in a corrupted condition, God does away with all of that in the end uh, after the millennial, and everything is, you know, in other words, eternal life is accomplished and sins eradicated and the corruption of sin. And so there's a new earth. Uh, it's, it's been renewed just like in the first heaven. That's a picture of going through a process of salvation, but, and, and there won't be any more process. It there will, once, once eternal life is accomplished, then, um, there won't be any any process that a person would need to go through in in having first heaven. Second heaven uh, is a picture. It's a picture of where, which we could go back here now to, and I've used this recently, but it might be uh, it might be good if we just went back to. Um, Genesis and where God actually removed Adam from the garden. And so here in the third chapter in the 23rd verse, it says, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which it was taken and he, so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And so uh, let me back up here to 22 again. And the Lord said, behold, man has become as one of us to know good and evil. This is after he sinned. And now at least he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So here Adam was in the Garden of Eden. Uh, and this is why I'm saying the garden's a picture of second heaven also. He was in a, a, uh, a place you know, where he had dominion over everything. There was no sin in the garden. He never committed a sin in the garden until he made the decision to consciously sin against God, knowing that the penalty was death. And, and when he did, he was, he was removed from the garden. Um, again, even though, and, and what we have in the in the Garden of Eden, you know, in the in the beginning of the creation, is both natural and symbolic, and you've got to look at it, understanding what part of what God's telling us is symbolic, what part's natural. It's not. God doesn't give us every detail; He just gives us a a fairly uh, synoptic uh, picture. Uh, you know, to, to, to see what happened. For example, he put man in the garden and he put 
in you know in in the garden was trees. He had the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and he had the tree of life, and then the other trees which were good for food. God, those 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 were natural trees. Uh, Adam and Eve ate of the trees that were in the garden, but now the tree of knowledge of good and evil has to be a symbolic tree, and so does um the tree of life there's not any tree that has any fruit on it it's going to give you any knowledge of good and evil and then there's not any tree that you can eat fruit of and it's going to give you life not the life from god it might give you it might sustain you for a day or two but, but we're talking about spiritual life let me let these folks in here um, and so, um, so, <clears throat> and then, well, the serpent, the serpent symbolic, there's not any serpent that can talk. God never made a serpent with an intelligence to be able to talk. That's symbolic. It's symbolic of, of, of evil and, and how evil worked, uh, you know, Everyone, not regardless of what their position is on the source of evil, I think everyone would have to agree that the way evil works is through the human mind. That's that's human corrupt. You know that Paul, I mean Adam, obviously is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know, if you study trees in the Bible, then uh, you know John the Baptist said, "Every tree that brings forth not." Fruit shall be hewn down. That wasn't certainly wasn't talking about natural trees. It was talking about fruits, fruits of the spirit. If you if you don't bring forth fruits of righteousness, you will be judged. And that's what John's message was. Uh, Jesus, the prophecy about Jesus in Isaiah sixty one, says that he was that we shall be called trees of righteousness. That God, you know, and that's just, those are symbolic terms in the Bible. The prophecy uses that very much. Uh, and so uh, I'm just trying to show that uh, in these three heavens, if you go back to, um, which are several, several scriptures we could look at, but if you if you uh, if you go back to the tabernacle and show the the uh, services and the furniture of the tabernacle, the outer court, you got in through gate through faith. I, I, these are things that we've we've said for a long time, maybe without really explaining any detail to it. Uh, but sometimes I think it pays to go back. And give some of the details. And so, you know, if you look at the at the outer court uh, of the tabernacle, you, you get in through the gate. Uh, and that gate is a gate of faith. That's the only way you can get in the kingdom of heaven. It takes faith. We're justified by faith and God. Uh, it's through faith that we enter in, but when we first come in to know the Lord, I mean, it's, we're, we're just babes in Christ. And so there's, there's a process that we have to go through in the second heaven. And I'll say it's a condition. It's a condition more than it is a place because this, this Paul said in Hebrews uh, that Christ, built a, a, a tabernacle or a temple made without hands. The first tabernacle was a literal tabernacle, but it all was a picture uh, it, that foreshadowed the new covenant that Jesus came to bring. Paul said that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And so uh, when you came in, through faith, and then when you brought your sacrifice uh, to the tabernacle, 
then that sacrifice had to be offered up on the brazen altar. And that altar, that's a picture of repentance. You know, you, you, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But And uh, Martin Luther brought that about. Uh, that was his main message in being the first reformer that God stood with that that the, you know, that the Reformation really got its ground, uh, its start on, you know, you might say grounded or established. Uh, but John and Charles Wesley were the ones that added to that message sanctification, that it took more than, uh, than just faith. Uh, and, and I mentioned the other night, faith uh, it's not just believing that God, that Jesus existed. Uh, faith, we're talking about, you know, not, Jesus said, no man cometh unto me except my father draws him. You, you can't even come to God if he doesn't deal with you. There has to be something in your life that God sees that he wants to uh, save you, and he has a means to do it. Uh, some people would say, well, God can do anything. He can save anybody. Well, yes, God can talk to anybody, but he, that, that's not how God works. God works through, he, you know, he works, he started out, like in the old covenant, he started out, of course, in the beginning, he, he was working through a righteous line, but when it came down to Abraham, that's where God made a covenant, and there's where God chose a people, and God worked through those people, and, and they were to be the oracles of God to the rest of the world. They failed in a gross way, but there, that early church was established, and God did make up a portion of his bride through that early church. And um, and so <clears throat> um, the the Lord doesn't just deal with an individual way off somewhere where He can't continue to talk to them on an individual basis, but He works through. You know, Christ said to His disciples, He said, "These things have I done, but greater shall you do, because I go to the Father." In other words, he was just one man. He could only reach so many people, but then 12 men could reach many more. And then all of the ministers that were called under those 12 could reach many more. And so Jesus, when he died, he had a little flock of 120, but it, it grew into thousands. Uh, no doubt, maybe uh, I would say hundreds of thousands. In the, in the Jewish world, and then, of course, it was opened up to the Gentiles. But when you look at the, when you go back to the tabernacle, that brazen altar, is, there's a picture there. When you offer up your sacrifice, you know, my wife and I are, are reading the, the Bible through. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to influence as many people I can to read your Bible through. And I'll even say this, if you have somebody that you can read it with, it's even more beneficial because you can discuss what you've read and it sort of keeps you on track. You know, in other words, each other, each of you is, you know, I mean, even if you're, you know, even if you uh, don't have a spouse, if you've got a friend that you read, you know, now, it, with all the technology we have, you know, my wife and I, we listen to Alexander Scorby read to us. We, we, we follow along in our Bibles, but, you know, I've even got a, a little speaker that I turn on in the mornings. We generally get up, get our coffee. <coughs> as soon as we get ourselves cleared, our minds clear, we, we, we do our Bible reading. And we have our Bible reading. We do it in chronological order. I, I read the Bible in 
I read the chronological Bible and King James Version um, because it's just, you'll understand your Bible a lot better if you, if you read it in a chronological order. I've said before, it's put together in, in categorical order because it would be very hard to find, you know, like for an example, your, your, your prophets, especially your little prophets, but even the big prophets, it, they prophesied during certain times of certain kings. And like, you know, if I mentioned, you know, what, if I mentioned to you for an example, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Nahum, one, one of those little prophets, I said, when, when did, who, what kings were, what was his story about? Who was the kings? What was the time setting? It's hard to put that together when you just read it because they're clumped together categorically under all the minor prophets, just like, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel are your major prophets, and they're clumped together categorically. But when you read in your Bible chronologically, when that prophecy comes in, when you're reading in the Kings or Proverbs, you're reading in, in Proverbs and Solomon writes a proverb at that time, it'll come in right there. But it'd be hard to find that particular proverb, just like, what was it? I think Moses wrote the 90th, 91st Psalm. His Psalms come in when it, whenever Moses gave it. Um, and so on the journey in, in the desert. So it helps you to, to get it in your mind of what happened when it happened. Uh, and and it, it just makes it, it'll just help you if you read your Bible that way. Um, but um, anyway, I brought that, the uh, reason I brought this up is because we're reading our Bible through and and we have our Bible set to where we read two, you know, in other words, if you read your Bible through in a year, you read so much a day. Well, we read two days. We've got it set up where we read it in six months. And the reason we do that is because there you're always going to get behind. I'm out of town. We can't read together when I'm gone, you know, visiting a church or well, I'm gone to the Dominican Republic or wherever. Uh, it, you just can't stay on track hardly. I mean, unless you're just a stay at home person, never does anything, you know, don't do anything. We, and we never hardly ever read on Sundays because Sundays are days given to church uh, almost completely. So, so we read enough for two days at a time, but we get, you know, we get behind. We always finish before the year's up, but we, we almost never finish. Well, we don't ever finish in six months. Last year, I think it took us maybe eight months to read the Bible through. Anyway, I'm bringing that out because we were reading and, you know, about uh, Moses taking the children across uh, the wilderness toward the, toward the promised land and, and what they went through in building the tabernacle and all the services that took place there. And, uh, you know, it just does you so much good just to read, just to rehearse that again. And, and you'll see pictures all through it that apply to down here. Um, the, uh, 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 again, the, the, the brazen altar. Aren't you glad that, you know, if you, if you commit a sin today that you don't have to take a little lamb to the tabernacle and put your hand on its head and take a knife and slit its throat and kill it and, and it be offered up by the priest on the brazen altar. It's a picture. Um, I'm, I'm thankful today that Jesus fulfilled all those sacrifices. I used to wonder why. I mean, I was a minister out in the religious world, uh, and I still wondered why was God so interested in all that red blood? Why was he so interested? 
and all those sacrifices being killed and all that red blood being offered up. Um, <clears throat> there's a scripture, let me give it to you here in Revelations, the seventh chapter, where, and here's a scripture that Brother, brother, um, brother, brother Souders used to teach. Uh, concerning the blood. Just a minute, I'll get it for you here. Okay, right here it is, the 14th verse. Revelation 7, 14. It says, I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, and he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. I said, Brother Souders, he used to teach this as the white blood. Of course, there's not such a thing as white blood, but he did that to get a point of cross in showing this scripture that they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Everybody knows you cannot you couldn't wash your robe in red blood and it come out white. But the he did that to show that the that the the blood of that what God was interested in was not so much his red blood. In fact, if you read the you know uh, the actual account of God having Moses after Moses was given the, the, uh, the old covenant of, of the law, the Ten Commandments, and the law that God gave him 40 days and 40 nights on the mount, God had him call the people up before him, the congregation. And I, I, I know I've mentioned this recently, but I don't think a lot of times when we read it that we realize what a great work God had in the wilderness with the children of Israel. There was over 600, I think it was closer to 650,000 men that came out of Egypt that were in the tribes, the 12 tribes of Egypt. Um, they... Um, and then that doesn't include the women and children. And it's estimated that there was about 3 million people out there in the wilderness under Moses' direction I encamped around this tabernacle. Uh, the tabernacle was about 500, I mean, I mean I'm sorry. It was, it was situated... Uh, where the gate was on the east and the, the Levites actually surrounded it from the east, south, west, and north. There were encampments first of the Levites and then the encampments of the 12 tribes around that. But how, if there was 3 million people, how far would it be from the easternmost encampment of Judah to the westernmost encampment of Ephraim. There was three in, there was three tribes to the east, three to the south, three to the west, and three to the north. If there was three million people, um, I don't know, Little Rock, Arkansas is a little less, it's less than three quarters of a million people. It's a fairly large town. It takes me 20 minutes to drive to church and I'm only halfway across town. Uh, it's, I'm about halfway to the middle of town by the time I get to church. So it's about that far to the other side of town. Now that's by car. I don't know if you rode a donkey, but now they were encamped in tents. So they were a lot closer together. But still, it may take you a half a day to ride a donkey or a camel from the west side 
of the tabernacle all the way to the east side, and I'm talking about the encampments. True. Uh, Moses and uh, Aaron and their families were encamped at the east of the tabernacle, and then Judah was in charge of the encampment east of that over uh, uh, Zebulun and Issachar. So Issachar and Zebulun and Judah was on the east side. Then on the south side was Reuben, the firstborn, uh, that, the tribe of Reuben, and with him, the tribe of Simeon and the tribe of Gab, that was south of, uh, that was Kohath, the Levites of the tribe of Kohath that was on the south side. Then on the west side was, was Gershom, and Ephraim, Joseph's son, that tribe was in charge of uh, Manasseh and Benjamin's tribe that was on the western side. And then on the northern side, there was uh, Merari, the Levite tribe, the Levi, I mean, it's one tribe, but it was the Merariites of the Levitical priesthood that was on the northern side. And then north of them was Dan and Asher and Naphtali. So there's, there was the encampment around that that amounted to about 3 million people. And the Levites weren't counted in that, by the way. So it was a big operation. <clears throat> and uh, so, <clears throat> um, so after the priest offered up your sacrifice, and that's a picture of humility. There's four, there are four principles here. The first principle is faith. The next principle is humility. And that's what the, the brazen altar is a picture of. When you come to God, you have to humble down enough to repent of your sins and be water baptized. It's that's a picture of repentance. It wasn't repentance wasn't made complete without a water baptism. You had to humble down and you know, make a public profession. You still do today to make a public profession that I'm going to serve God. I'm going to give up the life of, of the world. I'm, I'm going to follow God. I'm going, I'm making a commitment. I'm making, I'm professing it publicly. I'm letting people know that, uh, uh, I've made this decision. And, uh, and I've humbled myself enough to go through this process in obedience to God and making that profession. That's a, now, uh, here's what Peter said about water baptism. He said, it's not an answer of a, it's a, it is an answer of a good conscience towards God, but not to the putting away of the sins of the flesh. In other words, when you repent, you're forgiven for all your past sins, uh, but it doesn't it, it doesn't do it doesn't do away with your future sins. See, uh, you're not you're not going to get rid of your future sins just through repentance. What you get in repentance is forgiveness for past sins and acceptance by God through faith into the kingdom of heaven. And we're talking about first heaven there. You're in a first heaven condition or first heaven state. Uh, and, and then the priest had to go before he could take the blood of the sacrifice into the holy place. He had to go to the laver and wash his hands and his feet. It was lined with women's looking glasses, the laver was. And when the, when the priest washed himself there, he could see himself. James called it looking into the perfect law of liberty. When you look into the word of God, which was, uh, that's just a picture of the labor. Uh, the, the brazen, the brazen, the, the gate and the brazen altar is a picture of Protestantism. It's a picture of, of, uh, the, the first steps of coming in before God. 
and being accepted of God. The laver is a picture of Pentecostalism. Brother Souders taught that, that Pentecost, when God restored Pentecost to the church in Reformation, he, it was established in the labor condition of the tabernacle. That's when you looked into the word of God. Uh, that's when God added knowledge and understanding and temperance was added there. And uh, God began to show more once the baptism of the Holy Ghost was poured out. There was more knowledge given with that. And Brother William Souders was the heart. He was the center of what God worked in the Pentecostal movement. That the, the Brother Souders' message concerning the body of Christ was the central uh, part of what God was working on to bring about the body of Jesus Christ. Not, not all of these different organizations, not all of these different um, uh, ideologies of man, but he's working on bringing us back to what the early church had in um, one body, that we would be connected, that, they, that all, of these, all of these things are outside of God's order. And let me say something about that right quick. I mentioned it here recently that God's order is a theological, it's a theocratic order. The order that's out in, in these different organizations is democratic. But I believe God in, I believe God actually calls that to come in to, to happen because under, under Catholicism, man was under a dictatorial order. And many people were hurt in, in that order. And so when God started the Reformation, he allowed these organizations to have democratic order where they had some control. The people had some control to protect themselves from a, from a one-man order and for where a man would, would uh, you know, and, and that's dangerous. It's dangerous when a man has so much authority if he doesn't have the mercy and the grace of God and the wisdom to know how to use it. That's a picture of the red horse, that the rider on the red horse was, he was, um, the rider on the red horse was, had a sword in his hand. He had power to hurt men. That's a picture, that sword was a picture of the Bible. And the rider of that horse wasn't Jesus, but that was sin had entered in after the falling away of the church and the white horse. Sin entered in and the rider of that horse had power because if you've got the word of God, but don't have the wisdom to know how to use it, you can be very hurtful to people. People can become victims of, of misuse. And when God called Brother Souders and showed him the order of the early church, you know, if you go back, um, and I want to be as kind about this because I certainly believe this was of God, but God knew that there would be error, and he knew that men would misuse and that there would have to be correction of it. Uh, in, in everything God's done, he's had to tolerate working through men that were less than perfect and made error and mistakes, and God had to develop those men. Um, and so, uh, so I think God allowed a democratic order for a period of time out there. It, 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 it gave the people a protection. Uh, but then after God began to show us the body, we've had to start learning how to operate as a righteous ministry and not be hurtful to the people of God. And, you know, I'll even be, I'll confess that, that when I was a young man, I didn't have near the wisdom. And I know that I, I didn't treat, you know, I didn't treat everything right. I, you know, I was too, 
uh, rash. I was, I was too strong in certain areas. God had to deal with me. I thank God for people that, that were able to take it, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, the people that stayed with the ministry God was working on, well, they got corrected when the ministry got corrected, or I might say the ministry got corrected and that, that, that helped the people. Uh, but God is still working on us to bring forth a righteous ministry. You remember Jesus in the early church, he gave those men power. He said, whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. But those men, you know, I gave y'all a lesson, was it last week, about the love of God, the difference between agape love and filial love, and uh, what, how God had to deal with Peter about that. Well, God has to help us. He's got to help all of us. That's that's why this. That's why there's a first, second, and third heaven. That's why we have to go through a process of maturing and developing in righteousness. You're not righteous when you come into this kingdom. Only through Christ, His covering, He imputes righteousness to you and counts you worthy because of the work that Christ did on the on the cross. But he doesn't intend for you and I to always be reckless babes in Christ and not actually develop righteousness. And that's where the labor, we, we go through a process of being cleansed by the word of God. And God's working on us, in other words, through this outer court and developing us and helping us to grow spiritually through knowledge of the word of God. I was going to say earlier that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and how shall they hear except there be a preacher? Well, we're, I'm not talking about just believing because a minister said it, but I'm talking about the anointing of the word of God that when God begins to work through a gift of the ministry, and it's not just anybody. It has to be someone who has been God, gave gifts, gave them a gift in the ministry, whether they're an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher. But that when that gift goes into operation and the anointing of God's word begins to operate through that gift, and then the ears of the people that are hearing that, and God touches maybe you individually, and God is talking to you, and you know it. You feel that anointing of the Word of God as it enters into your mind through your ears. You hear it, and God's talking to you. You know it. The preacher may not even know who he's talking to, but the person that hears it, they know this is God talking to me. That's where faith comes in through revelation. God does that. It's spiritual knowledge. It's not just hearing something, but I'm talking about the spiritual knowledge of the word of God through an anointing of God's spirit that's dealing with the person. That's the faith we're talking about that causes you to enter the kingdom of God. It's not someone convincing you that they're, you know, that what they're saying is right, but it's that anointing of the Holy Ghost through the gift of that minister that God's talking through, and that creates faith. It comes by the hearing of the anointed Word of God, and how shall they hear except there be a preacher or an anointed gift that will minister that to you? And so that, that's how you get in, through that through anointed word of God that created faith in your heart that you responded to. And, and then, of course, the, the uh, brazen altar where you, you, you're offering up your sacrifice, it's, it, there's the picture. I was giving you a picture a minute ago about the blood of Jesus, okay, in the seventh chapter here. 
they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Um, and I've talked to the people here at home and they know that I've told them that Jesus is the red blood. God's not interested in red blood. Red blood can never make you righteous. It's not the red blood that Jesus, that God's was interested in. It's true that there was a natural death that Jesus went through. He fulfilled the sacrifice of all of those sacrifices, the lambs, the, the bullocks, the, uh, the fine flour, the turtle, I mean, the doves, Every, every sacrifice that's offered back there, the peace offering, sin offering, burn offering, all of those offerings, Jesus fulfilled uh, literally in his life, and he died and gave up his life. But let me show you a picture here. When Moses, when God told Moses, take hyssop, which was two uh, little plants dip down in the bowls of blood of the sacrifice of the covenant and and then take those those hyssop plants with the blood on them and sprinkle it out over the congregation call this congregation up and, and seal them in the blood of the covenant okay that was a type of Jesus what Jesus was going to do in the early church but he didn't do that with red blood he didn't take red blood into heaven to get it accepted of God. But what he took was is his life that he lived in the Holy Ghost. The reason God chose red blood for the forgiveness of sins to be applied to every soul was because he told Moses the life is in the blood. And that, there's the picture. Jesus's life was in the Holy Ghost. It was in the Spirit of God, the Spirit of life from his Father. That's where his life, that's what sustained him. Red blood sustained him a natural life. The white blood that I'm showing you here, the Holy Ghost life that he was born of when he got to this earth. No man was ever born of the Holy Ghost, never born of God after the fall of Adam. Adam was the only man that was born of God, and then Jesus was the next man that was ever born of God as a human. And then he told Nicodemus, except you be born again. He brought about a new birth on the day of Pentecost that we could be born of the same spirit and nature of God that he was born of, and that was the spiritual blood that the, the picture of the red blood in the old covenant is a picture of that that life of the Holy Ghost was applied to us. Like for an example, when, when the, the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb was put on the doorpost, that's a picture. Yes, it, you know, the natural blood of Jesus, yes, it accomplished the fulfillment of the sacrifices. But the picture, the, the reality of it is when the baptism of the Holy Ghost is applied to your life and it, it covers you from the death angel. It, 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 you're no longer under the curse of death, but a life has been applied to you, not through the fallen nature of Adam, but through the life blood or life of the Holy Ghost, spirit life that was in Jesus Christ. That's why you can be washed in the blood, which is the Holy Ghost, and be made whiter than snow. The Spirit of God will make you righteous if you'll let the Spirit of God develop you and work in you. You, you got to let it, that's why it says to be washed. You know, we've got to go through a washing of, of, uh, by the Spirit of God. It's of the Word of God, by the Spirit of God that we're washed. And so God's taking us through that process. And for us to get in second heaven, the holy place, 
See, when you look at the tabernacle of the holy place, there was a the candlestick that had seven lights. They had to be trimmed every morning and every evening. Those lights could never go out in the tabernacle or the temple. They, the, that, that had to take place. Aaron had to make sure that that took place. Um, and uh, then there was a table of showbread, of unleavened bread, 12 loaves. That's a picture of the 12 uh, the, the uh, doctrine of the 12 apostles of the early church, there was no leaven. Leaven means falsehood. It, it's, it's puffed up. It's got yeast in it. But without any leaven, that's the truth of the word of God without any ideology of man that makes it anything less or more than the truth. And so <clears throat> that was a picture in the holy place that holy place, uh, and and you don't just go in there. You, you got to go through the outer court process to get there. In fact, after the priest washed, you know, he had to change robe. He had to change clothes out of a woolen garment, which is a picture of the flesh, into a linen, white linen garment, which is a picture of righteousness. We're told in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelations, and so you got to be righteous. <clears throat> and there's a picture of that. While we're talking about second heaven here, Paul was caught up into paradise. Now, so if you go back to the Garden of Eden, where man, I showed you in the beginning, where man got kicked out. And I don't know, I, I, you know, part of this is symbolic, part of it's natural. So it'd be very hard to say that Adam couldn't have got back in the garden. The only thing that was keeping him from the garden was two cherubims and a flaming sword turning in every direction. And that had to be symbolic. There wasn't a gate, there wasn't a gate, there wasn't a fence around the garden. And that helps you to understand this was a condition he was in with God. What he lost was not a natural place. He lost a relationship with God. God put him out of that relationship. And now least man put forth his hand and eat of the tree of life and live forever. He'll have to pass through those two cherubims, which is a picture of God in Christ and the two covenants that represent them in the earth, the old and new, and pass through this flaming sword, the word of God that turns in every direction. It judges everything. And for you to get back in the garden, you're going to have to go through that. And the garden was a place where Adam wasn't allowed to sin. Remember, Jesus was on this earth and he never committed a sin. That's because he was, Paul called him the second Adam in, in 1 Corinthians 15. And so there he was. And, and God, he, number one, he had, he, had a, he had a benefit over us. He, number one, he had the Holy Ghost. And God and the angels ministered. God had a responsibility to his only son. And for the calling that he sent him, he could have, he was tempted in all points as we are, so he could have, he could have given in to his temptation. You can't, there's no such thing as a templess temptation. So he was tempted, but he never gave in to it because he had power. God gave him power to live above sin. And Adam had that power. God would have never placed him in the garden and told him he couldn't sin if he didn't have power to keep from sinning, but he consciously made a decision to sin. Adam passed the, I mean, I'm sorry, Jesus passed the test. He did not give in to sin, and he had power over it, and he lived in a garden condition his whole life. He never did. He never did partake of the world. And so he, he wasn't in literally in the Garden of Eden, 
but he lived in that same condition. And for us to get back in the garden, we're going to have to pass through. See, now this helps you to understand it's a condition. Because for you to pass through these two cherubims and this flaming sword, that's not a literal place. And, and you would be dead if you passed through a sword turning in every direction. So that, that's a picture for you that we're, we're to go through this, these, the, you know, God and Christ and the covenant that they've made with mankind and go through judgment of being God taking us through a process from a baby in Christ all the way to maturity or what the Bible calls is perfection, a finished work in God. And, and that's a second heaven condition. We're not going into the Holy of Holies. You know, only Adam could, uh, I'm, I'm, so, uh, I'm sorry, the high priest could only go there once a year. And that was just a picture. He was just showing a picture of what Christ did. Um, You know, there is, and I'll just mention it. I've said it a lot here lately about, I keep rehearsing this, but I just think sometimes it just does good to slow down and go through some of these details to help people really understand uh, what we're saying when we're talking about first, second, and third heaven. And uh, to go into heaven itself, you know, in other words, once you've, uh, let me let me let me just mention here that Adam Adam was in the Garden of Eden without sin for however long he was there without sinning. In fact, he wasn't permitted to sin without being judged, eternally judged, death. Um. And so he he was he was in second heaven, but he wasn't perfect or fully mature there. And so to me, that means you would have to be in that place to become fully mature, to finish the work of God, to be able to go into the Holy of Holies where there is eternal life. But down here is the dressing room where we got to go through these this process of what we're calling first and second heaven to get there. Um, I want to maybe let's look at Hebrews nine here. And I'm going to try to wrap this up. I don't know what time it is. What time is it? Eight o'clock. Okay. Look in Hebrews, the ninth chapter here for a minute, because the apostle Paul alludes to, this worldly, this sanctuary. And he says here, he says, then verily the first covenant had also ordinance of divine service and of worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick. Now here he's showing, now what he's talking about here is inside the outer court is where the holy place and the holy of holies. It was actually one building in the temple, it was actually one building of tents made by tents uh, or covered with curtains uh, in the tabernacle. And the first compartments, what he means here, the first compartment, wherein was the candlestick, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, see, when you first went in there, after the priest washed in the laver and he went in, he went in through the first curtain, and which was called the sanctuary, and that was called the holy place. And after that, the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. So between the two, holy place and the holy of holies was another curtain, the second curtain that no one went beyond that first that first it went into behind that second curtain with the high priest, and he went once a year only. We'll read about that here, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant 
overlaid round about with gold, wherein was a golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it, the cherubims of glory shattering the mercy seat of which we cannot speak now particularly. It was, you know, it was lost and, and done away with by the time the apostle Paul got there. But, but um, this, um, these cherubims, those were just two at each end of the ark, um, ark of the covenant was these two golden cherubims that were just wings that faced one another, which was a picture of God and Christ uh, that overshadowed uh, the word of God. Uh, Aaron's bud, the rod that budded, you know, if you remember, uh, God showed that his rod was the only rod that would bring forth right, or life. And so it, it was put in the ark to, to uh, testify that the golden pot of manna and the, the tables of the covenant, the two stones of the, with the 10 uh, commandments on it, that all of the law of God, the 613 ordinances stood for those two tables of, of the covenant. And over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy sheet, seat of which we can uh, cannot now speak particularly. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. See, when Jesus went back to heaven, he didn't carry red blood. What he carried was, was the Holy Ghost life that he laid down for you and I. He laid down and died. He had no sin, and where there's no sin, there's no death. But he willingly let God put him to death to bear the sins of the people. And it was the Holy Ghost life that he had, he had to die from the life in God that he had, even to die physically. Because I don't care who you are, even in eternal life, you're physical. There is a physical life. I mean, we're not just in oblivion. <laughs> it, there is a physical life even throughout eternity. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. There was no way to get into the holy of holies or eternal life under the old covenant, you could get a, you know, I mean, the the faith, the people of God got, re, they were granted resurrections, but not, they were not granted eternal life. That covenant could not produce that. They couldn't be born of God, even under that covenant. In fact, that's, you know, that's ultimately what God sent Jesus here to do was to bring a new birth through the spirit and reconcile us back to God from Adam's fallen condition. We're all born of Adam, but none of us were born of God until Jesus brought the new birth through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Verse nine, which was a figure for the time then present in which we were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to conscience. In other words, the high priest could not be made perfect. His conscience couldn't be cleared because he he couldn't, he still had a sinful condition. You know, every year he would do this for his sins and the sins of all the people, making an atonement for them once a year. That was just a picture of Christ once and for all offering up a sacrifice that. God would continually accept. He tells that, which stood, verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. There's this 
tabernacle I'm telling you about tonight, first, second, and third heaven. It's a, it is a tabernacle of God, but it's made up of people, not of a literal tabernacle structure. That is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of bolts, goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. You know, as well as I do, that Jesus never went into the holy place, literally of the temple. But he went into a type, a condition of the holy place. As a matter of fact, he lived in it. And in that life and condition he was in, he obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. In other words, God would forgive you year after year after year for your past sins. It did not do anything for your future sins. You still had to offer up sin offerings, burn offerings, peace offerings, drink offerings. You still had to go through a process during the year. If you committed uh, a, knowingly a sin, you had to offer up a sacrifice to get forgiveness for it. And God would forgive you. But it didn't make you righteous. It just forgave you. God, God imputed righteousness to you for your faith and obedience. Um, okay. Uh, verse 15, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must be necessity of death of the testator, for testaments of force after men are dead, otherwise it's of no strength at all while the testator liveth, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, in other words, the first testament, something had to die. A sacrifice had to be made of a life animal representing what Christ would come to do. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of, of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in heavens, notice that word heavens with an S, I'm telling you about all three of them, should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices with these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He went in, not only he lived in the holy place, and but he entered into the holy of holies where his father and the heavenly angels are nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world but now once in the end of the world notice that in the end of the world i've said over and over almost every scripture in the new testament dealing with the end of the world or the last days was talking about the end of the Jewish world and the last days of that world. We're living in the end of the Gentile world and, and we'll enter into the last days of this world when the church is restored, which I don't think we're far off from that. In the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So <clears throat> the judgment is when, you know, what, in other words, once a person died, then it was determined, were they just, were they unjust, or were they perfect? Uh, 
you know, and, and that has to do also with, it's appointed unto us once to die out to the flesh. Uh, but but here, what he I still believe that he's saying here that it you're everybody's gonna die. <laughs> but then there is a judgment that has to be determined on your condition of where you're at in your walk with God. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. In other words, the first time he appears to you, he appears to you in salvation, the salvation process that I'm talking about, going to a first heaven condition with God, developing, growing in righteousness, and, and God finally taking you to a place of maturity, putting you back where you can go into second heaven through the two cherubims, the flaming sword turning in every direction and God finishing his work in you so that you are worthy of eternal life. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is remembrance again, made every uh, made of sins every year. In other words, they went through the process to get say, to get their sins forgiven once a year and start off with a clean slate but it didn't do away with their future sin condition because they were still in a fallen nature of Adam and they had to be born again for God to develop them out of that. For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast no, no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it's written of me to do thy will, O God. In other words, Jesus, he, he realized when he's here on the earth, it's not, it's not the blood of bulls and goats it's God interested in. It's finally God's bringing this to its culmination of me that I'm going to have to go through the sacrifice of living a righteous life for and lay down my life for the, for, for the world. And when he had said, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither had his pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second covenant, that is, by the which we will, will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And I'm about through here. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till all his enemies are tilt, not all, but till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering hath he perfected forever them that are sanctified. I need to explain that because just because Jesus went through offering himself, it didn't mean that it made you perfect. It means that he perfected the plan of salvation for every man that will enter that plan of salvation. Where, where uh, the Holy Ghost also witnessed to us that after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws in their hearts and in their minds, I'll write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where the remission of these is, there's no more offering for sins Having therefore, brethren, boldness, this scripture, by the way, there's this scripture 
I don't like the way the scripture is interpreted because I believe the interpreters got it wrong. In fact, I know they did. Having therefore, brethren, boldness, that word boldness, I would rather, in many places, it's interpreted confidence. I don't think any of us are to be bold rushing into, you know, we're angels, fear to dread. But I think we can have confidence in the word of God that God has showed us how to please God and how to develop and enter into the holiest. That should be the holy place. That, uh, that the holiest here, let me show you. It, th this word, hagion, it is a sacred thing and it's translated four times sanctuary, three times holy place. Where did it go? Excuse me. And one time holiness, holiest of all three times, holy place three. So that word was used. So the translators really didn't, I don't think they understood that this, that we, we have confidence if we grow in God that we can enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus or the Holy Ghost by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart of full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised. So um, I'll just, I'll stop right there. But I, I think, you know, I just think that I was feeling today and this week that it would be good just to go over the fact that that natural tabernacle and temple, it had a, it was a picture and a shadow of things that were to come with the true temple of God that, that was made without hands and how those pictures and types of the furniture and services in there applies to our salvation that takes us through a first heaven condition with God as we grow. Um, and then, um, and develop us into a, a mature, what did Paul say in the fifth chapter of, of Hebrews that um, milk belongs to babes, but strong meat belongs to them that are full age. See, he's showing you right there that you come into this thing as a baby, but when you grow and develop and you get, um, when, when you finally get to a full age, you will, how he said was that you would discern both, you would discern both good and evil by the, uh, how do you say that? By the reason of your use of your senses. Here, let's look at it right quick. Let's get it right. I'll close with this. Right here. Um, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are full age, even to those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. See, there's things as you grow in God that you're, 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 you're going to be doing things you don't even know is wrong until God reveals to you that it's wrong. He probably will reveal it to you through an anointed man of God. The word of God will be preached under an anointing and God will speak to your heart. And you'll know that the Lord said, I've accepted you where you're at, but I'm not going to accept that anymore. I want you to move up another rung. I want you to climb up the ladder another rung. I want you to, I want you to do better than you're doing. You can do better. You've got a greater knowledge than what you had. And so God will put pressure on you to develop more. And, and so 
you will discern. You'll finally, through spiritual discernment, you'll discern, well, I can't do that anymore. God, God winked at that for a period of time, but he ain't gonna wink at it anymore. Now he's requiring me to, to he's given me more and to whom much is given, much is required. He's requiring more out of me. See, that's why I can't judge myself by you. I have to judge myself by God's judging me. I'm not judging myself. So when God tells me, you're gonna have to do better. You're gonna have to do more. I'm showing you. You know, I remember Brother, Brother Linegar taught on, on pride. And when Brother Linegar spoke those words, that pride is selfishness, you can't use the word pride anymore. When he said that, God spoke to me. He said, don't use pride. You, you, pride is not a word. God, God, he resists the proud, but he draws nigh to the humble. He said, start saying, I'm thankful. Don't say I'm proud. Say, I'm thankful. I'm, I'm thankful for my children. I'm thankful that God gave me uh, the knowledge and the wisdom to teach them, the understanding to teach them righteousness. And I'm thankful for their success and the things that they're doing. But I'm not, you know, I'm thankful, but I'm not proud because I didn't do that myself. I did that. God did that. He helped me to know how to raise my children or whatever I accomplished. You know how I accomplished it? God's blessings on my life. You know, I didn't accomplish it in a worldly way, but I've served God in humility and God's blessed me and favored me. And I can't be proud. I can't be, I'm not thankful for myself. I'm thankful for God, for what he's done in my life and what he's helped me to accomplish. I'm not a worm anymore. I was when I came to God, I was, nothing, but I'm something now because God is, he's, he's changed me. I'm becoming righteous. My character's becoming righteous. I'm thankful for that. God has made me, he's, he's made something beautiful out of nothing. <laughs> you know, I'm not finished yet, but I'm not a nothing anymore because I'm one of God's children and God's children ain't nothing. They're something, they're precious to the Lord. So God bless all of you. I hope I said something to help. I know it was a little bit maybe lengthy and I may, maybe some may have just said, you know, I don't know. Then you all may have wandered off on me. I don't know, but I think some stayed with me. Anyway, I just wanted to touch on that a little bit tonight. Brother Smith? Yes. I know it's late. Would there be room for a quick, a, a question sure. for a quick sure. answer? Yeah. Um, at the beginning, when we started out, it talked about um, Paul when he was caught up into paradise. Yes. And then the paradise there, is that second heaven? Yes. Yes. Where, where <clears throat> paradise is, uh, look, Jesus said to the thief on the cross. Yes, that's where I was going next. Yeah, he said to the thief on the cross, that thief recognized that Christ was righteous and he asked him remember me when you come in your kingdom we don't get the full rendition of what was said there that day but it, it had to be good enough that Jesus accepted the humility of this man that he had faith in Christ and Christ told him he said this day shalt thou be with me in paradise he resurrected in Matthew 27 52 with in Matthew 27, 52, it says, and any of the saints which slept arose and went into the city and were seen of many. Isaiah 26 said, together with my dead body shall they arise. Okay, paradise. See, second heaven was available from the day of Pentecost until AD 70. Just because it's available don't mean you can go into it. It doesn't mean you can have that condition. It just means it's available, but you will have to go through a process to get there. Okay. You can't just, you know, have faith and get in and then jump to the holy place. You wouldn't even understand the sevenfold lights and the seven spirits of God and the unleavened bread. But if you go through a process of God working in your life, and developing you and gain you gain in knowledge and you're 
like Paul said, you're uh, transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God, then God's brought you to a person. In other words, it, it's available, but you got to go through a process to get there. Okay. That's how I was. Yes. Down yeah. here, I don't see, you know, a lot of people hold this against me, but I don't see that it's available. We're in first heaven. I do not see second heaven being available until the church is restored. Now, there's too much confusion in the ministry. There's still, but, but let me say this. If you will serve God faithfully in all that you know to do, you're going to be just. You'll resurrect in the resurrection of the just. You will, you'll make it. You, you know, in other words, once God develops us to a place that we're ready, I don't want to go into second heaven. If it means that if I sin one time there, I'm going to be eternally judged. I want to be righteous enough that God gave me the power to live above sin and I can live like Christ did in a sevenfold light and with the unleavened bread of God. And uh, so uh, where I'm at in God, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm content where I'm at in God. I don't want to be behind him. And I don't want to get ahead of him. But I do believe there's a restored church coming that God is going to open up. As a matter of fact, let me, let me just give you this scripture right quick. Um, in Revelations 11, how do I get this thing out of my way? Okay. Okay, here the seventh angel sounds. This is the seventh trumpet. This is the last. This is in the end of the Gentile world. This is the last trumpet. Remember Jesus in, in First Thessalonians 4, it, he's coming back and, and, uh, with the sound of a trumpet. That's the seventh trumpet. The sound the what that's going to sound that's the last prophetical hour down here okay and there was great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kings of our lord and his christ and he shall reign forever and ever well won't we be glad to see that you can't say the kingdoms of this uh, of uh of this world has become the kingdoms of the lord yet he's not back on a white horse and in, and in control of everything and the head of the body really yet. But verse 16 says, and the four and 20 elders which sat before God on their seats fell on their faces, worshiped God saying, we give thee thanks O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art come because thou was taken to give thee great power and has reigned and the nations were angry and thy wrath is come. When the church is restored, just like in the early church, this the the body of Christ is gonna it is going to stir up this world and the world is going to be angry about the judgment that God's going to bring on this world because of the righteousness of His people and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets and to the saints and them that fear thy name small and great and should destroy them that destroy the earth. There's a resurrection of the just. And look at verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of the testament. There were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. That's judgment. So the heaven's been closed. It's been closed. When the church fell away, you couldn't get in Etern you couldn't get in the temple where uh, the Ark of the Testament is. But now in the seventh trumpet, when God, in the same way that God resurrected people in Matthew 27, 52, and the just so that they could enter in and receive their reward, God's going to do that in the end of this world, that the resurrection of the just down here when the church is restored, 
and the temple of God's going to be opened and we can get into the Holy of Holies. Once again, it'll be available to us. So, but just remember this, all we can do is what God has asked us to do. If you'll serve him with diligence and with all you know to do and remain just in being faithful, he'll do more than his part. He'll do his part and you will be secure in God. You don't have to worry about God not recognizing your faithfulness to him and your diligence to serve him and obey him. That's all he can ask of anybody. That's all he will ask of you. You do your part, you're secure. God will take care of everything else. And so, you know, it, it, it's all a process that God's taken us through to get us to eternal life. Just like I said, that scripture on first heaven and first earth passes away. Let me say something about that real quick. Again, in chapter 21, Revelations 21, I saw new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and first earth were passed away. See, when God finishes this work, you're not going to have first heaven anymore. There's not a process. Everyone will have went through that process. No one will have to go through the process of being saved and living above sin in a second heaven place or condition. Jesus today is our high priest working out of second heaven condition, giving us what light he can give us from the sevenfold light and the unleavened bread. He's our high priest. We're not in there eating it of ourselves at our own will because we just haven't developed there yet, but we will. And then look, and the first earth passed away. The corruption of sin is going to be done away with. This earth will be cleaned up and there was no more sea. That's the ungodly. That's the world of the ungodly. There will be no more ungodly world once God cleans it up after the thousand year millennial. John saw the holy city of New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride for a husband. So he's coming down with the bride to dwell among us throughout eternity. So I'm ex I, I, my wife asked me not too long ago, she said, why are you so gung-ho about all that? I said, I'm gung-ho about the message. It's a message of the word of God that, that keeps me encouraged and helps me to know, you know, I've been blessed that God's help, helped us to know and understand uh, the plan of God. I was going to bring us I was going to stop this sharing. How do I do this? Stop share there. There we all are back. All right. Before we go home, let's let's all pray, brother. Uh, brother John, brother Clark, ask us. Brother John Clark, I don't. Uh, he asked us to pray for his younger sister that has cancer. Uh, let's remember her tonight as we pray. Keep remembering Brother Shane Clifford's family. You know, he was just 42 years old, died last week of COVID. Uh, this is a strange disease. Older people mm -hmm. that are sick and wore out don't seem, you know, I mean, some of them live and the younger people get it and they die. We, we can't figure that out. It's a strange disease, but hopefully, according to the experts, we're, we're hopefully nearing the the uh, the end of the pandemic. They're thinking it's going to move into an endemic, and even though people still be getting sick, they won't be dying with it, or real sick as they have been in the past. So, anyway, let's keep remembering that family, brother Bill Daniels. Please keep remembering him, sister Crow, brother Weaver, uh, brother Jacob Durham's got COVID right now. Uh, Brother Keith, are you over COVID? No, sir, I'm not. Um, I'm still congested. I'm still got a cough, and I don't know if chills is one of the uh, one of the symptoms, but I, I chill every once in a while. Yeah, it is one of the symptoms. Well, we keep praying for you, Brother Keith. Uh, you should be getting down close to the end of it. You 
had it long enough. I talked to Sister Terry Durham today, and I looks like her and the kids all all of them look like they're getting it. So let's pray she for knows. Jacob and Terry Durham. Yes. Oh, uh, chills, diarrhea, fever is not running too much. The, some of the people are getting fever, but not that high. But they are complaining of diarrhea, chills, um, just fatigue, flu-like symptoms, big time, is what they're what some of the patients that we've got at our clinic has got. They said that that's what they got. What I got a question okay. uh, with diabetes and. Uh, High blood pressure, is that another factor that might keep, make it prolong? Uh, you have to be careful what you eat, uh, what you take over the counter. You just need to contact your primary care doctor and ask him what he wants you to take. Because our doctor is telling our patients that the dialysis patients that they can take the Tylenol code, uh, Rotos and DM, some of the I'm things doing that. that. Yeah, <laughs> vitamin, vitamin C, D3, and zinc. That goes too. Uh, okay. What about Sister Reva? Uh, you and the girls, are y'all okay? No, Matthew had it. Maybe Sister Reva can. I have it also, but the girls seem fine. And bless your heart. I know you. Tried to stay away from it, but I knew you was in danger since Matt had it. We'll be praying with you. Thank you. All right. What else? Somebody else got a prayer request? Keep praying for Brother Bro Goss, the church in Keswick. Brother Fisher? Brother Smith, uh, Mallory has her heart appointment on Monday. So um, we asked the church to be praying about that. And then we do have an appointment we were they it's a blessing it's a it's an answer to prayer um the um the stomach appointment was being in may and now we're going to actually be able to have it this next week the, 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 Lord. the following week so very happy about that but y'all would be praying for her on monday for us to find out if they're going to give us a progress report on her heart all right my cousin brother steve Sutmiller and his wife um is got COVID again. So pray for Brother Steve Sutmiller and, and and Diane, his wife, in McAllister, Oklahoma. Any other prayer request? Let's well, everybody uh unmic your mute your your mics, mute your mics. together. And ask God to meet these needs and give him a praise. praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God. 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 Oh, God.